Hi, this is Zivi Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And speaking of books, I have two of my own books coming out this spring and summer. Princess Charming is a picture book, which debuts on April 19th, and Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature comes out on July 1st, and it is truly a labor of love. I hope you'll pre-order, order, order, and join me on tour as I go across the country. You can find out more at zibbyowens.com or bookendsmemoir.com. And you can follow me on Instagram at zibbyowens because I always post about everything. Enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. I need your help. If you love this podcast, you will love my children's book. It's called Princess Charming, and I am really trying to drum up pre-order sales. You might not know this, but before a book comes out is actually a really important time for the whole book's trajectory. So please pre-order Princess Charming, which comes out April 19th today. Just stop what you're doing and go do that, please. When it arrives on April 19th, you can give it to a loved one in your life, a niece, a grandchild, a child, a student, a kid walking by on the street, (laughs) anybody. But if you could do this, here is my offer. If you email me your receipt showing me that you bought the book online somewhere and pre-ordered it, email info at zibbyowens.com. That's info at zibbyowens.com. And I will pick 10 people to do a special giveaway project award to from my new Bonfire merch store, which you should also check out, which is um, the Zibby Owens Media Bonfire store where you can get all sorts of cool t-shirts and uh, tote bags and author sayings and all sorts of great stuff. So or did I say 10 of you are going to get a special care package of your choice from the Bonfire store. And I will pick at random from all of you who pre-order the book. So if that wasn't clear, go pre-order Princess Charming. Again, it's called Princess Charming. It's my debut picture book. It's really cute and great. And it's illustrated by Holly Haddam. And then after you get the receipt, screenshot it or forward it to me at info at zibbyowens.com and you will be entered to win one of 10 exciting care packages. So go off and order. Thank you so much. Bye. Chelsea Beaker is the author of Heartbroke. She's also the author of the novel Godshot, which was a finalist for both the Oregon and California Book Award, long listed for the Center for Fiction's first novel prize, and named a Barnes Noble pick of the month. Her short story collection, Heartbroke, came out in April 2022. Her writing has appeared in the Paris Review, Granta, The Cut, McSweeney's Lit Hub, Electric Literature, and others. She is the recipient of a Rona Jaffe Writers Award and a McDowell Colony Fellowship, originally from California's Central Valley, which, by the way, is where most of these stories take place. She lives in Portland, Oregon with her husband and two children, where she is at work adapting Godshot for the screen and writing her third book, a novel about motherhood. All right. Welcome, Chelsea. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Heartbroke. Thank you so much, Sibby. It's such an honor to be here. I love your podcast, and I'm just so inspired by it all the things you do and how you're lifting up authors. So it's a joy. Oh, that's really nice. Thank you. Okay. I have to tell you that I, <laughs> I was putting my son to bed the other night when I was reading your book and I, well, right when I had started your book a few nights ago and he was like, sometimes he asks me to read him what I'm about to read. Cause usually I read to him, I put him to bed and then I sit by the side of his bed and I read. And this time he was like, read me your book. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, oh no, this was not the book I should be reading aloud. So next thing you know, I'm like skipping all, all these words and like spider. I'm like, why is he go? Okay. Well, you know, and oh my gosh, it was not the right book to do that, but it was delightful to read out loud. <laughs> I'm shaking my head. No, I'm like, that's not the book for bedtime. Not the book. No, No, not the book for bedtime. (laughs) Although he did fall right asleep. So I don't know what that says, but uh, anyway. (laughs) Okay. Well, why don't you tell listeners a little bit about what Heartbroke is about? Yeah. So this is a collection of stories and they all take place in California Central Valley. That's the place that I grew up mostly. And it's really a place that I've returned to a lot in my fiction writing. I think that when people think about California they are not thinking about the Central Valley. It's such an interesting place. It's a unique place. And it's also where so much of the world's food comes from. But I think mostly people are like, yeah, I've passed through there on the 99 on my way to LA. You know, it's like this sort of scene is this kind of, I don't know, 
one cow town that's what, just what, there. what exactly is what do you, what is considered like what towns from what to what is the central valley i mean i grew up in fresno which is really the center of it it's almost directly in the middle of california and then i always imagine like sacramento being kind of this northern point of it all the way down to i guess like bakersfield so okay. that swath <laughs> like right in the middle and so a lot of the stories are set there most of them actually. And, and I've kind of tweaked it a little bit where they're, they're kind of adjacent. They're often like, I'll, I'll use fictional names for towns. I really wanted the freedom to use that as my base and then make it my own. I did a similar thing with my novel Godshot, which came out in 2020. They kind of exist in the same world. And these stories I wrote at the same time as my novel. And there's even like some overlapping characters. There's a lot of similar themes. And sometimes I would take a break from writing my novel and I would write a story because Mm -hmm. stories began to feel like this great escape for me. And stories are really my first love and what I started writing originally. So this book tracks, you know, the last 10 or 11 years of my writing. A lot of these I started just so long ago. So it's been interesting to walk with them over the last decade and, and do like one final revision last year. And just see, I mean, a lot of it was like, whoa, where did I think of that? You know, it's like you you change so much in that time. And I would say a lot of the stories really center around this broken child-parent relationship. We're hearing a lot from mothers, we're hearing a lot from and fathers, and and also from from children. And it kind of I would say the connecting sinew here is is really what happens when the bonds of those relationships are broken and tested. So it's hard to say what the book is about because each story is about its own thing. But I think that's kind of what is uniting a lot of these pieces together. So basically, this is the product of your procrastination from writing novels. Is this, <laughs> this is what you did on the side. <laughs> yeah, I finished my novel and I was like, hey, wait, there's actually the second book too that I love just as much and and feels like just as close to me. So that was, that was cool. That and been, if, that must have been very good news for your agent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're like, I also have this one just sitting here. How lovely. <laughs> yeah. I, by the way, I love the cover of this and also of Godshot. Who is your cover designer? Do you, do you know who it is? They're like, yes. Very, yeah. She's awesome. Her name's Nicole Caputo and she does a lot of the catapult covers. She does covers for other houses too, but she really just had an immediate vision for both of the books. And I immediately was like, yes. So there really was no dancing around like tweaks or different covers. It was only really after the fact of the books kind of of us confirming the covers that I would see like what the other options had been. Um, And yeah. And, and these were always, she kind of got it right on the first try. So I love the covers too. I think she had a real way of pinpointing a tiny, tiny detail in the book and and blowing it up in a way that that is surprising but also I think works so thanks for saying that that's funny no I love it maybe because I used to eat the, these candy things candy necklaces yeah know, constantly as, as a child and and all of that so the first story at least mamas don't let your babies grow up to be minors this story is I mean it's dark it's hard it's sort of it's very sad about a minor and relationship with and how an injury really affects the relationship and and that's something that I feel like is super relatable and applicable to so many situations like even something as simple as like a a knee injury or something today, right? It changes the dynamic. Like everything that happens to each person in this unit really can throw off the whole thing in a way. So talk to me about that and how, you know, how it takes so so little almost for a a relationship to be stressed in this way and how to to repair it or maybe not, maybe not possible, but. Yeah. I think with this story, I was really wanting to examine kind of this, the narrator has grown up under her parents who had this kind of abusive controlling relationship. And she feels like because she's seen this and knows what it's about, she won't fall into the same trap. Mm -hmm. And then she kind of finds herself in the same trap. You know, (laughs) the, the shiny veneer of the relationship is sabotaged by this injury where it's like that marks this moment where I think this minor that she's with, his his true personality, his true addictions, all of the that darkness is able to really come out because he's been 
sort of couch ridden. He, he's been taken, everything's taken away and he relies on her in this extreme way. So it highlights, I think, what was always probably wrong in the relationship that she just wasn't quite seen. And, and so we watch her journey through this often as it is in abusive relationships, you know, it is this journey of like reckoning with the truth that you really don't want to look at. And so I wanted to examine that up close with this story. And it was just such a pattern that I would watch my own mother go through again and again with men where as a child watching that, you're like, do you never learn? Do you, what we know, we know like logically the warning signs, we know the red flags, but then when you're in it, something else takes over. And and it is this whole psychological thing that you could talk about for hours. But I think from the child's perspective or the young woman's perspective, it's more black and white. You're just like, well, you're stupid if you if you fall into that trap, I'll never do that. And then she finds herself right there. So I wanted to kind of look at that in this story. Well, I'm sorry your mom went through that and that you're the child of this situation. Have you had moments where you had to fight against that in terms of your own choices of partner or has it come up or have you just like examined it to death and now it's not even a, 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 a fly on the horizon or whatever? It's really funny because I think people always say like, oh, you marry your father. And I was actually raised by primarily my grandparents from like age nine to 17. And I was like, well, I definitely did not marry my father. Like my husband is so different from my dad. He's different from this like stereotype of the abusive man or any of the controlling. I definitely went in this other direction. But then lately I've been like, I think actually I married my grandmother. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, I still kind of did that, but not the way that you would think. So, I mean, yeah, I continue to think about the domestic violence that I grew up around because I've really seen the ways in my adult life, the way that that trauma and that violence doesn't really just die out because it's over. I'm still affected by it. And I may not be affected by it in this like present relationship, but it's still sort of there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of how trauma works. And so it's that daily work of unpacking that and, and processing that. And I think a lot of this book is my subconscious doing a lot of work around those kind of bigger questions. We don't have to talk about this if you don't want. Although you said you could talk about it for hours. So let's just give it like two minutes. If- totally. <laughs> I'm happy to talk about it. <laughs> so what happened between ages zero and nine with your, and then when did you end up living with your grandparents and like how much were you privy to and how much do you remember or, you know, all yeah. that? Um, from about zero to six, I lived in Hawaii with both parents. And there were some times where we would come back to Fresno and like leave my dad and then return. And there was some back and forth, but primarily those were like the solid years where my parents were still trying to co-inhabit. Okay. And then when I was six, my mom and I moved to Fresno and lived alone from six to nine. And those were some really dark years because she was very addicted to alcohol and drugs and she was alone and it was just not, it was not good. And eventually I was taken away and in place with my grandparents when she left. And then they raised me. So my grandfather had lived in Fresno for most of his life. He founded the agriculture department at Fresno State. They were very, I don't know. I always think about how they really did save me from a lot more trauma that I would have acute if I'd stayed with my mom. But you know, my mom leaving is still like this greatest heartbreak of my life. It's something that's that's always there. It's it's super difficult, especially when raising your own kids. As my daughter gets older, she's kind of reaching the ages that I was when so many of those things were happening. It's almost like I re-see it, right? Because you're like, oh my God, I can't believe that was going on in my life at her age. She was almost eight. And and it you almost have to like re-wrap your head around it. Yep. And that's why therapists exist. (laughs) And I think that's also kind of why I've always been drawn to writing because you're asking me like, how much do I remember? Well, I think the truth was always skewed and people were always there to kind of tell you like, well, that didn't really happen Mm -hmm. or it wasn't that bad. And I think from a young age, I just felt like I needed to write things down to make sense of them. I needed to see them on paper to see what was true. And, and that was really a driver, I think, from a super young age. 
they should really just pair you with a therapist when you like get an MFA or submit an yes. article or an essay, right? It should be a required part of- 100%. Right? Everybody's got <laughs> stuff that needs to be worked through. So, although maybe not, because maybe then, then the literature wouldn't be as good. So I take it back. Yeah. Right? You never know. <laughs> you never know. Could do like a before and after or something. Control, yeah. experimental control group or something. Well, that is really, really hard. And I'm sorry that that happened. Are you in touch with your mom? Is she? Yes. I am. I mean, we've had a phone relationship mostly. I've only seen her a couple times since I was nine. And she lives in New Mexico and you know, as she gets older, it's, it's ever more heartbreaking, right. To watch what, what does late stage alcoholism look like? Well, I can tell you it's really ugly and there's nothing, I don't know. People I think have a stereotype of the alcoholic. And in my mind, I was always like, well, some of those are correct, but then some don't even begin to touch it, you know? (laughs) And so it is really hard. I have to be boundary, I, especially through the pandemic and going through the stress, like my dad died, everything just seemed to hit in those two years. Everyone's had a, everyone's had a really hard time. And then it's like compounded by loss and grief and all these different things. But I've had to really like practice and learn just how much I can handle like energetically with, with her and, and really how powerless I am with her choices. Uh, that's been the great lesson of like, especially my early twenties when I really wanted to save her. And I was willing to like go on this road trip to New Mexico and do this intervention and do all these big gestures thinking that it would be the only way I could sleep at night yep. or feel guilt-free yep. if I had just done everything I could. And, and so I do feel like in some way I've done everything I could. And it's like, no matter what, you're still going to feel bad about it. So might as well protect yourself at this point. And I just don't. Yeah. So, so it's about boundaries, but on her good days, like my mom is so funny. She's such a storyteller. Actually, the story you mentioned, the minor story was totally inspired by her and a college essay that she wrote that I found in our storage unit. Hmm. She was such a good writer. She had many talents. And so I try really hard to like look at those good parts of her when I can. There were many. Yeah. Her life was, it's a sad life. What do you tell your daughter? Well, she's never met my daughter. I don't, you know, I'll, I will buy like Christmas presents on behalf of my mom, things like that. My daughter has like a, kind of maybe a vague idea that, that a grandmother exists sort of somewhere in the distance, but she hasn't asked too many questions. I'm kind of waiting for the questions to roll in. I'll tell her little anecdotes mm-hmm. here and there when they see when it seems fitting. But yeah, I, I really wanted to not put too much of it on her. But she did see me reading this Al Anon like day by day book the other day. And she was like, I'm gonna read it to you. <laughs> and and she read it and she's like, I don't really get what they're saying. And I was like, yeah, well, it's kind of written for people who, and like, I tried to explain addiction and all. Yeah. <laughs> and she just kind of looked at me blankly and was like, whatever. And like, walked away. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's like so wonderful that you don't even register what this means because already at your age, like I was very, I'd been to like thousands of AA meetings, like crawling under everyone's chairs. <laughs> Oh, you know, so it's cool on one hand that she isn't tuned into it. That was the whole point of having me having kids and like having a better life. But at the same time, I know there will come a day where I'll tell her the more of the story and more of her family lineage. Have you thought about writing a memoir? Oh, yes. I've thought about it. I don't feel ready yet. I've written some essays that have been it's been really amazing the feedback I've gotten from the essays that I've written. I mean, people mm-hmm. just respond so much to those real stories and and so many people would write like, oh my God, like this is, I grew up like this too. Or, you know, it, and that really felt like, oh, okay, maybe there would be a, a time where I would want to write a book about this. But right now, like fiction feels like the way that I can explore some of these things in, I don't know, a way that feels more free for me at this time, but you never know. Maybe, maybe I just need a little more time to kind of process some things first. Just no rush. <laughs> There's no rush. There's, There's no, no rush. rush. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I have a lot of friends who write memoir and I'm like, that looks hard. Like all writing is hard, but, but a memoir is its own particular 
thing. It's very vulnerable. So I feel like fiction is much harder and I've tried, to do, <laughs> I've tried to do both. And I don't know. I feel like I start trying to write fiction and I'm like, all right, well, like who can I dress up, but is really an actual person that I can now describe right. <laughs> because like conjuring up completely false people or like not false, but just like making a person out of nothing. I'm not good at that. You know, that's, yeah. that's like a real gift. Like people are like, oh yeah, like I know what she eats for breakfast. I'm like, how? How do you know that? <laughs> I, how do you know this much about a person who doesn't exist? But it's true. Because, and then you read novels and you get to know them just as well. So then I feel like yeah. they're real people. So anyway, totally. it's a gift. All I'm saying is I feel like that is the true gift. I mean, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Now I'm now I'm denigrating memoirist, which I'm including myself in this category, even though I, which anyway, they're beautiful memoirs. Every, oh, yes. Everything everything is Okay, let me get myself out of this hole. Okay. <laughs> All I'm saying is for me, totally. fiction seems harder. End of story. So I yeah, I, I totally understand. I think it's there's something for me that feels scary or like entrapping with the details already set. It's like with a memoir, it's like, well, the details, like the story is set. Like what happens has happened. It's already there. And I think some people are comforted by that and can really work with that structure. And then maybe someone like me is like, oh, that feels really confining. Like I actually Mm. want to be able to change the names of towns and like blend two people into one. And and that feels more comforting to me. So I think, you know, many people do both, but there is sort of that inherent difference. Interesting. This is probably why I haven't like built a house from scratch. (laughs) That's like so overwhelming to me. I would much prefer to like take a house and make like little tweaks and Totally. (laughs) Anyway, it's a very, sorry, that was a, anyway. Okay. So what else are you working on now? Anything else you have stored up to delight your agents with? Yeah. So I am working on a new novel and it's pretty different than these last two books. I would say that it's, I mean, it has an adult narrator perspective versus like a more adolescent perspective. And it's, all about motherhood. So it's sort of like looping back to how we started the interview. It's a lot about, you know, what does it mean to like mother your own children with this mm-hmm. sort of haunting past behind you? And and what is what are the effects of that? And most of the effects of that I think are not seen, mm-hmm. you know, day to day. You just see this mother in the grocery store. Well, she looks like a normal mother or whatever, mm-hmm. but but what's behind that and like what's informing a lot of that. And so it's really inspired by after I weaned my daughter from breastfeeding when she was two, I had like weaning induced anxiety and depression, which I didn't even know could happen. I hadn't really had traditional like postpartum depression. And I just, it really hit me unexpected. I was like, what is going on? And then come to find out it's a, it's a semi-common thing that happens. So I was like, I really want to write about that too. So it's just a lot about that experience of motherhood, all the things that nobody tells us. And, (laughs) and then, you know, this character who's really dealing with some extreme past secrets and there's kind of a a twist in there. So it's been a really fun book to write. Um, still in the midst of writing it. And sounds amazing. Is this this where you write, like where you're doing this now? It is. I've got, I got this little corner in here. We moved into this house in July, so still kind of figuring things out, but where are you in the world? Are you still in California? No, I'm in Portland, Oregon. Oh, nice. Awesome. Yeah. Well, at least you have beautiful light. You have beautiful light in there. It's coming <laughs> in. Yeah. We had some sun yesterday, but today it's raining again. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And when you're working on a novel or when you're working on short stories or whatever, do you get up? Like, do you, are you very structured with your time or do you just sort of, like, how do you do it? How do you approach it? Well, when I was writing these two books, I have two children. My son is almost four. You know, when I started this, I had no children. And so <laughs> my my work uh, approach was so different then. And then a lot of it was written when my daughter was born and, and in those first years where I was just so scared, I think, mm-hmm. of losing that practice that it was like any minute she had her eyes closed to sleep, I was like at the keyboard mm-hmm. obsessively. And and I really developed this pretty exhausting productivity where it was like anytime she was asleep, I felt that I had to be writing. And, and I think that served me well for many years. But after the birth of my son, my body was just like, I'm tired. Like... <laughs> 
I need more balance. And so now it's sort of this question of like, how do I get a little more balance? I, I don't want to only use their sleep time for work, you know, and they get older and your time changes and you get more space, which is slowly now happening for me with my son being back in school. But I think it's just now I'm shifting into wanting those like longer stretches Mm -hmm. a little bit. And so now I kind of, now it's like if he's in school and I'm paying for preschool, like that has to be my fiction writing time. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's kind of the same like pressure I'm putting on myself, but a little bit, I guess a little bit different, but yeah, it's, it's just like, I've always said, like never underestimate 30 minutes. Truly. Like I, I can really, you can get a lot done in 30 minutes. You can really crack open a scene in 30 minutes. You can figure out one detail of a character that's going to carry you for the next writing session. So for me, it's all about just taking advantage of the time that I do have. And piecing, it's a lot of piecing together. It really? honestly doesn't look graceful at all. No, I am like <laughs> ridiculously impressed that you got it done with such little kids, but that's all this work. That's really awesome. So hats off. <laughs> hats off to you. Look at all the things you're doing. I mean, no, but my kids, kids are older now. I mean, my littlest one is, is seven. So, okay. You know. Yeah. It's different. Yes, I, I look up to mothers who have like their youngest is like seven or eight, and I'm like, wow, you really entered a different dimension, right? Because it really my son, is. my son is still like walking into traffic, like he's still like a baby. Yep. So, you know, yep. we're still in that moment where there's a lot of just like physicality that goes on. Yes. But now with my daughter, I'm like, oh, you're just like this person in the world. Like, it's a totally different. Not that we don't have a lot of things with her it's but it's more emotional right it's like yes. less like picking you up from the slide and all that like intense watching isn't yes the, the, the fear shifts <laughs> yeah, the fear shifts the, the fear, fear is shifts. still there in some yeah. ways but it shifts yeah, yeah. It's, I'm not worried they're gonna fall down the stairs if I turn my right. back or something <laughs> which is nice I think somatically to let that yes. go a little bit because that's like that is where I carry a lot of my stress is just yes. that constant worry Yep. It's like this evolutionary imperative to be yeah. alert. You know what you were saying about post weaning anxiety. And I'm like, I feel like I have had postpartum anxiety for 15 years of it. Yeah. So, it may know, be so, true. I think I said again, you know, I, mine like predated my kids too. So I can't really use that as an excuse, but yeah, yeah there's a lot to be nervous about, you know, well, anyway, that sounded depressing, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I realized just how much better it would get when all the kids were seven and up. Mm -hmm. I think seven is the big turning point. That's my two cents. I thought it would be kindergarten and it wasn't. Sorry. Sorry to push the goalpost for anybody (laughs) hoping for kindergarten to be the saving grace, but give it a little more time. (laughs) I agree with you. Five was still hard. Yeah. (laughs) I think seven is the, is the turning point. Okay. Last question. And you've kind of answered this already, but for advice for aspiring authors. Yeah. So I did talk about, you know, taking advantage of those shorter times, but I would also really say that I would, I I hope, what I hope for aspiring writers is that they can really love their own writing. One thing about writing that I go back to is that it's a joyful practice. Like I'm having a lot of fun writing. I'm laughing out loud. I'm like rereading what I wrote and dying laughing. Like (laughs) sometimes I'm crying when I'm writing, like it's this whole bodied experience. But at the end of the day, I love my own work. Like if you don't really love your own work, why would you expect somebody else to want to read it or love it? Like, I think it's important to try, you know, as writers, we're so self-critical. There's this stereotype of the writer who's just like, you know, embedded with nothing but doubt. And, And there's a lot of talking about how hard writing is and it is hard. I'm not saying it's not, but I'm saying there's also room for another perspective where actually it's joyful and actually you love what you're doing and you have that, that confidence. And I think that can help you see through the difficult parts of writing, like rejection and and times where it doesn't feel easy and really hone in on those moments where, where it's fun and you're loving the project that you're working on. So have the confidence, I would say, or aspire to. Yeah. Aspire to confidence. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aspire to confidence. <laughs> and you don't have to answer this either, but is that your natural hair color? Are you naturally blonde like that? As a child, I probably was more okay. of a shade. I definitely have some highlights going on. But it was never like <laughs> brown. 
No, no. Always kind of, I guess my natural color, which I did see during the pandemic finally, (laughs) which grew out to like my, my ears or my chin is sort of like this strawberry blonde, I guess. There's a lot of red in it. I didn't know about. That's so cool. Yeah. But as soon as I could, I got into that salon and was like, brighten me up, baby. Yeah. So (laughs) I get it. I get it. My hair has turned like black as I've gotten older. So, you know. Yeah. It changes too. The texture changes, all of that. Anyway, but obviously these are, uh, these are the good problems to have. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. So, well, thank you. Thank you for being so open and honest and letting me sort of dig into your past and being so kind about it. So thank you. Of course. Yeah. It was my joy to talk to you, Zibby. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 